We were saying that new churches are necessary to saturate cities and regions with the gospel. Let me give you an example of this. The, uh, the Christian Missionary Alliance had worked in uh, Guinea in West Africa for many, many years. And for the longest time, they would evangelize and there would be many, many people who would make decisions for Christ. Uh, but for some reason, the churches were not growing. The church growth was very flat. And then they decided that they would start planting churches in the villages more immediate in proximity to where people lived. And they would actually have to empower lay church planners and pastors to lead these churches. They didn't have enough ordained, fully trained pastors to just go out and start all these no churches. So two things had to happen. They had to have a vision and the desire to start these new churches in the villages. And they had to mobilize lay people to give leadership to these churches. Most of them were new and rather going to be small. And so uh, they developed a program to train these lay people to become church planters. And now take a look at what actually ended up happening in this region. You can see that from roughly 88 to 1991, the growth of these churches and these bar, the bar would show the number of churches uh, was flat. But in 92, they start planting new churches. And as they start planting new churches, the number of churches goes up. And the number of lay pastors here is the blue bar as they plant these new churches. And they were able to increase the membership of these churches uh, it wasn't just a number of churches, but the, actually the membership of the movement uh, well more than doubled as a result of this by getting churches into the proximity of the people and then having more effective follow-up. So if we're going to reach more people for Christ, we have to actually have more churches saturating a region. And then another reason is that new churches are necessary for long-term growth and discipleship. And this is essentially what we saw with the example from Guinea in West Africa. Many times people make some kind of a decision for Christ, but there is not the effective follow-up of discipling those people, training them, helping them to learn to walk with Christ. And new churches are more effective at doing this. In fact, estimates are that the attrition rate of evangelism where new believers are not assimilated into churches is somewhere between 50 to 80 percent. In other words, if a person, maybe they attend an evangelistic campaign, they make some kind of a commitment to Christ. If they are not brought into connection with a local church, then well more than half of them will probably not continue in the faith. Local churches are communities of people. And by bringing them into communities with people, they have a community to help them grow. They have a community to give them support. Many times when a person becomes a follower of Christ, they may be rejected by their family. They may experience opposition. They may have to break contact with old friends that were not healthy for them. And so when a person becomes a new believer, they need a community. They need a support system. They need a new family many times. And if you have a church, that church becomes that new family. And new churches are especially effective at receiving new people in to be part of that new family. Sometimes existing churches, the relationships have become uh, long-standing relationships. You know about this. Everybody's married or related somehow with everybody else. He's, this person's married to that person's cousin, and this person, this uncle has is the elder in that church. And everybody kind of knows everybody, and they've, they've all grown up there. And an outsider, a new person comes into this, and he goes, wow, they're all related. They all know each other. And here I'm kind of this newcomer. I'm not really a part of that. Well, see, when you start a new church, everybody's new. And it's much easier for a new person to be assimilated into that family, not feel like an outsider, to be welcomed in, to build those relationships they need that are going to help support them in growing in their walk with Christ. And so new churches are necessary for long-term growth and discipleship. 
New churches also stimulate established churches to greater evangelistic activity. Now this is where sometimes sort of the, the idea of competition actually becomes um, a positive thing. And I can give you some examples of this, where uh, I can think of two cities in Germany where we came in, and the other evangelical churches kind of said, well, you know, I don't know why you're here, but fine. And then when we wanted to do a particular approach to evangelism, they said, oh, we, we tried that. That won't work here. That, that doesn't work. We said, well, that, that's fine. We're going to go ahead and try it anyway. And we led a lot of people to Christ. We used to do tent evangelization, where you'd, you'd put up a big tent that would hold 300 or people or so. And then every evening you'd have meetings. And of course in Germany, when you put up a tent like this, and you, you put it on the Folks Festival grounds, they're not thinking of, uh, of an evangelistic meeting. They're thinking of beer festivals. They're thinking of uh, folk festivals. And so tents are sort of festive things. So we would have these tent meetings. And, uh, and um, we, we led a lot of people to Christ that way. Now, sometimes the existing church said, oh, we tried that, that doesn't work, you know. That. Well, then they found out in this one city we were working, they had done this maybe five, six years ago, said it didn't work. We did it, we led a whole bunch of people to Christ. And they go, hmm, maybe we ought to try that. And they went, and then a few years later, they did a tent evangelization. Well, the good news was we helped each other. They helped us with our tent. We helped them with their tent. More people were reached for Christ. And churches that had kind of become discouraged, they looked and they said, how are you doing that? You're reaching people we haven't been able to reach. One time there was an older church in town and uh, they, they were doing a good enough job sort of holding their own, their young people were reached for Christ and so on. They were amazed that we were reaching people who had not grown up in the church. And one time they invited us to a lunch together and they said, we want to learn from you how you're reaching people for Christ. And so new churches, often because they're more creative, uh, they come in and the existing churches say, you know what, we need to evangelize also. We need to reach people also. We can learn from the new churches. So that's kind of an extra little bonus that oftentimes happens when you're planting churches where there are other existing churches. And then also, new churches mobilize more workers. Now this especially happens when you have an existing church that sends out workers to start a new church. Because what happens? Usually that existing church sends out some of their good people. This is what happened, of course, in the Antioch church. The church in Antioch, the Holy Spirit had set aside Paul and Barnabas. I mean, Barnabas was the one who was, went there and affirmed them and was their first contact to the Jerusalem church. Paul, of course, was a great teacher. They sent out their two best teachers. And so churches, existing churches, when they say, we want to start a new church, if they're going to do it right, they're going to send out some of their best people. But what does that mean? That means in the existing church, they lost some workers. So what are they going to have to do? They're going to have to train up some new workers to replace those workers. In the new church, in a new church plant, everybody is a worker. There's nobody who's just in for a free ride in a new church plant. When we started, I'll give you an example, when we started the North Munich Church. It was a daughter church. There was a central Munich church. I showed you that with around 300 people. And then they sent out about 30 adults to start our new church. We took two pianists, concert pianists who'd studied at the, the music uh, conservatory there. We took two deacons. We took an elder. We took a, a pantomime group that, that did sort of theater stuff. We took a lot of talent from the mother church. And so what did they have to do? They had to train up new deacons, new elders, look for new musicians. And so in a larger existing church, sometimes people say, well, somebody will do that. There's always somebody there. This is a big church. I don't have to do anything. Well the existing church starts mobilizing new workers. In the new church, well, you're only 30 people. you got a lot to do. Everybody becomes involved. And sometimes the person who said, oh, I don't think I'm good enough in the big church. No, no, other people can do that much better than me. But see, in the new church plant, hey, we don't have anybody else. 
<laughs> and so people become involved. And you know what? They find out they have gifts. They find out they can do it. And if you help them, you give them some training, they do it well. So you mobilize Christians who many times in a larger church, they're passive. They just come on Sunday, they leave. They don't think they have spiritual gifts. They let everybody else do the work. In a church plant, it stimulates both existing churches and the new churches for more people to become involved in serving and developing their spiritual gifts. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. And then finally, new church planting is a key to social change. Now, what do I mean by this? Many times we say, you know, to be serving God in a community, we want to be salt and light. We want to not only preach the gospel and lead other people to Christ, but we want to impact this community. We want to make a difference. Maybe we want to fight against human trafficking or prostitution. Maybe we want to see poverty alleviated. Maybe we want to see fair treatment of workers. We want to see something of God's righteousness and justice in our communities and compassion being exercised. And new church planting is going to be a key to that social change. Why? Not only because there's more Christians, but it's in life change. It's as people's lives are changed in Jesus and then they're living as communities in the neighborhoods they can have that salt and light effect much more effectively. Now there'll be some things that they can do together better than they can do individually, but the new churches creating these new salt and light communities are a key to social change, to exercise and compassion. You see, that new church is gonna be able to take a lot more energy to take that, that person who's struggling with alcoholism, to care for them, to get them the help they need, to be able to build relationships with people in need, to make a difference. And so I believe that church planting, because it leads to human change. You know, there's been so many programs to try and fight poverty, but as long as the person's life, their heart is not changed, you can only do so much. And new church planting changes lives, and those lives begin to change societies. Don McGavern, who was a expert in studying church growth. He's talked about what they called social lift. That when people become Christians, they begin to just live better lives. And what happens is the next generation lives a better life yet. For example, let's say a community where the father tends to be an alcoholic or he's a gambler, he's going out, he's not spending time with his family, the family money is being spent on maybe alcohol or gambling or uh, just having partying, whatever. The family life is not healthy. But let's say that father becomes a Christian. He starts paying more attention to the family. He stops giving money out for all these other things and maybe he's buying better food but he's also concerned about the education of his children. And so those kids, instead of also being on the road to poverty, not being able to have good education, they start spending time so their kids do better in school. And then that child has an opportunity to get a better education and maybe to go to college or university or maybe to have a better training in one of the trades. And so then that child moves out of poverty. And we have seen this over and over again. As people become Christians, they start investing in their own children. They start investing in their own communities. And people begin to move out of poverty because of the values that Christ has brought. And so we sometimes call this social lift. It may take a generation sometimes too for that to begin to really take effect. But this is the power of the gospel. And so it's gospel preaching, life transformation, community transformation.